sing the gospel story in John 3.16. God so loved the world. Join us. Here we go. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come find His mercy. Come to the table. He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness. Find what you're looking for. Come on, church. Here we go. For God so loved the world Coming to church and we get to just lay it all down at the foot of Jesus. We can bring all of our imperfections and all of our failures and know that He will forgive us. Amen. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. With open arms, see his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Come on, church, let's celebrate today. He is worthy of our praise. So there 
Jesus for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved. came just for that. Wow, just think how good the sermon's going to be. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you this morning. All the vacations have started up. People are starting to go in town, out of town, around town. They're all getting kind of on a roll, right? They're getting going. I hope everybody goes safely and comes back safe. We're so thrilled to have one back today, I know, from a long journey. Uh, he's the... Uh, He's that, everybody know about the, what was it, Timex watch, takes a licking and keeps on ticking? Is that Timex? Well, that's Paul down here. We're so glad to see you back today, my brother. We are thrilled to death. This is a joy and a blessing beyond words. And, and while I'm saying this, let me tell you, I, I, um, I, I really, I, I love to visit people and go to hospitals and do all that kind of stuff. But 
If, if I did all that, then why would I have a staff that's able to do it? But uh, Jim Garner and, and uh, all these guys, I mean, our guys have kept up with Paul and they've kept me reported on everything going on. Uh, they've really followed up. Andrew and uh, all oh, just so many of them that just love you to death. And, and old guru over here, you know, he, he got his own little walker. He just left it here and ran over and saw Paul. I, you know, so man, and, and it's good to see you click. You're ticking too, aren't you? You feeling good? You're a good guy. You know, they have a camp this week. You going? Not this one. You're going to the high school camp? How old are you? 80? You're an idiot. <laughs> but we all knew that. It's in the blood. You got that right. You know, I may just show up down there too. That's a, that's a great camp. All this is going on now. And, uh, and I'll tell you, next week, you don't want to miss. Uh, next week, we got uh, Lance is coming back with Rebecca. They're going to be singing. Lacey's going to be here with Caleb. They're going to be singing. Uh, it's going to be a glorious 125th anniversary here at Northside. It's going to be a day of celebration. There will be almost no sermon, right? See you Monday in my office. <laughs> we, are, we are excited about next week. It's going to be a, a wonderful, wonderful day. A lot of reunions going to be going on through all the years, so I'll be thinking about that. Following the service today, people say, well, I'm, you know, I just like a place to serve. I'm trying to find a place to serve. Camp Hope. Camp Hope. Now, there's going to be a meeting right after church in the fireside room down this hall and you can make a difference in the life of a child by just serving at Camp Hope. It's not a, it's in a week long camp. This is a, a camp that meets during the summer one night or one, one day and it, it's just a special, special time and Brian will meet with you there. And don't forget the baby bottle fundraiser for Grace House is going on so if you haven't picked yours up, do that. And the best summer ever kits are available for everybody too so uh, be, be involved with that. Well, I'll tell you, yesterday uh, had a beautiful service for a lieutenant commander of uh, the Navy who was on every aircraft carrier that the, the U.S. has. Actually was in charge of all the computer systems that run all the protection, take care of us, protect us. And the funeral for Bill Kaufman was a special day. But tomorrow, we're going to lay to rest the heart of Weatherford, Bob Glenn. Bob Glenn is a man that has touched so many, many, many lives in this community and made such a difference and an impact that I don't think you can equate him to anybody else who's grown up in this town. Out of the poorest of beginnings, he became a man who became a mentor for so many. So many men that were saying, I'd love to say something, but I just can't because he literally has touched my life so deeply, I cannot speak of him without tears. But let me tell you something, he is good. He is rejoicing with the Father, healed from that cancer, free at last, from that bondage that age had brought on him. So tomorrow at 10 a.m., we're gonna have a special memorial service right here for my friend, my brother, and the Lord's servant in so many ways, Bob Glenn. And uh, I just pray if you can be here, you come and, and be blessed by the support of that family, Carolyn and all the family. But uh, visitation will be today, right here in the auditorium, beginning at four o'clock and it'll go to six o'clock. So uh, be aware of that. We actually have out there right now, a prayer quilt for Uvalde. And also during the Bible study hour, our children, are going to take Frisbees and write messages on the back of those Frisbees to those kids down there and their families. And that'll all be carried. Uh, we're also giving some of the happy hats that we have. All a package that's going to go down there. The FBI called John Forrest this week and said, can you bring your service dog down? And he said, yeah, but I wanna find something else. 
you can tie a knot on a prayer quilt that's going to go to Uvalde right out there in that hallway. And it's going to leave right after church today and make its way down there for uh, the covering of those, uh, those blessed people down there. Radio broadcast today, Bill and Betty Sewell, in honor of their 60th wedding anniversary. That's a hard ride. <laughs> 60th wedding anniversary. And then Chuck and Judy Thomas, these flowers are for their 60th wedding anniversary. I don't know that I've ever had a Sunday where there were two uh, 60th wedding anniversaries. So uh, let me tell you, this is a great place. Church of all generations. And we certainly celebrate it in many ways today. In just a little while, you're gonna be participating in the Supper of the Lord. I pray that your heart will begin to be ready. You just sang one of the greatest songs that I think could be sung. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And I pray that you'll prepare your hearts for this. And that when we come to that time, if you don't have one of the cups, like maybe I do, yes, one of the cups, be sure and go to the door and you can pick one up to be prepared uh, for that. Did y'all get one? No, no, yes, no, yes. Pray for our camp this week. Teenagers that are putting their phones down and going away for a week. God can do a great work right there. We open our hands, we open our hearts. Father, right now, I pray that in the midst of this service, you would begin to give us a real sense of why we're here. That it's not just a fellowship with friends. It's not just to sing songs of joy, but it's to meet you, our God. God, I pray that you would remind us today, not just of the sacrifice of Jesus, but I pray that today you would remind us of the fact that without him, we would die an eternal death. God, help us to remember that we have been saved by the blood. We have had our payment made by the broken body. God, help us to remember we need Jesus. I pray for our nation today. I pray for the the guidance of leaders, that wisdom might come and cooperation might come, that our nation might unite. I pray for those blessed people that have lost loved ones through violence. And God, today, I pray that evil would begin to be struck down in this nation, that the possession it has over individuals with no regard for human life would be taken away and that they would begin to understand the consequences of actions. Bless us as we worship now, that our hearts might be filled with your spirit in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand back up to our feet as we sing. See, on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free And look at the wounds that give me life Grace flowing from His side No greater sacrifice What He's done, what He's done All the glory and the honor to the Son my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven, I praise God for what He's done. Come on church, let's sing for freedom. Sing for the freedom He has won, even death is dead and done, His life is overcome. Me. Say the name above all names Over every broken place He is risen from the grave What He's done What He's done All the glory and the honor to the Son My sins are forgiven
will complete He reigns in victory A king Hallelujah to the King He is worthy to receive All the worship we can bring people said amen and you can be seated I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to John chapter 6, your phones, your iPads. If you brought a laptop, I guess you can do that too. John chapter 6 and verse 51. I want to talk about life beyond the ceremony. We have different celebrations in life that represent things that have happened or that we desire to happen in our lives. And those celebrations sometimes cause us to believe that we've actually moved to a certain point or that we actually are invested or involved in a certain thing. Some ceremonies though have consequences. A wedding, that's a ceremony. And your life changes after you go through that ceremony. People sometimes will come up to me and say, boy you, boy, you tied a great knot. You really, that was a great service. That was a beautiful wedding. Well, we'll see how the marriage goes because it's not about the wedding. I've been, I've been a participant in weddings that cost $65,000. Some of you young ladies may want to start talking to your dad, your mom, about what exactly it's gonna take. And I've been in weddings that I stood up in the chapel with a couple of people that just were ready to commit themselves to each other. A lot of difference in the ceremony, but no difference in the import of it. The truth of the matter is, it's not about the wedding, it's about the marriage. Ceremonies are just formal acts that we go through. They're, they're things that kind of let the public know what's going on in our lives and they represent and testify of things that we are, are participating in. When you get married, you're saying, I take this woman, I take this man. When you take the Lord's Supper, you say, I take Christ. What difference does it make? 
The ceremony has an intended purpose beyond the act itself. In other words, there's life beyond the the ceremony. This can be a beautiful ceremony for the Lord's Supper today, but it's just gonna be a simple one. You're holding in your hand or you have in your possession a piece of bread and a cup of juice that represent the body and blood of Christ. If you just look at it and say, well, this is just bread and juice, you're missing the whole point. You must invest in it to make it what it really is. What it will be for you at the close of this service is based on the way you see it as you begin to think about it now. Jesus is not concerned really about the bit of cracker and the juice. He's more concerned about you and I consuming the greater emphasis of his life. Jesus wants us to consume him. And this is found in John chapter six. Rather long passage, but listen carefully as you read it, every word. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Now this statement caused great problems for the Greeks, the Romans, and the Jews. Well, what is this, a cannibalistic religion? Well, what's the deal here? Well, you know, of course, that what he speaks of is that his body is the bread of life. And his body is a spiritual body. It went into the ground physically and it came back spiritually. The text I've chosen this morning is not a traditional passage to emphasize the Lord's Supper. The language flesh and blood may cause us to think of the Lord's Supper, but Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about us consuming him so that we are transformed into his image. Let's look at this, receiving the life of Christ. He begins right away, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. Eat this bread, you'll live forever. The bread that I give is my flesh. And they said, how can this happen? We sometimes get all caught up in the elements. We, we, we talk about, well, this is the body of Christ and this is the blood of Christ. What was happening when the Corinthian church, however, was that they were more consumed with the fellowship than they were the Father. They were more interested in what it felt like to go to church and see all the people and be involved in that more than they were with their relationship with God. Amen, you hear me? That's kind of easy to do, isn't it? All of a sudden you're thinking about, boy, I'm gonna go to church because all my friends are there and when I get there, I'm gonna be able to see them. We're gonna be able to get together and I love those people and it feels so good. It's good to hear what, and I get to be loved on and all that stuff happens. Did you meet God while you were here? It's not about the fellowship, it's about the Father. And Jesus said all the fellowship you could have, they were having these love feasts. In 1 Corinthians 11, he said, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you 
because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must be also factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One's hungry, another's drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Are you to despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. Evidently, this was the beginning of casseroles. (laughs) When they came together, they all brought a covered dish. And they all sat down and they called it fellowship and they called it the love feast and they all enjoyed the fellowship. And there, but you know, just like people can get, some of them were quarreling over here. Some of them were more uh, wanting to know if they were sitting with the right people. Some people got ignored, some people got received. And Paul said, what in the world are you doing? It's not about the fellowship as much as it's about the Father. Jesus said, just as you take food and drink with your body and it becomes a part of you, then you need to receive me into your innermost being. You need to feed on me. Feed on Jesus. Impart his body into your own. Jesus is the bread of life but it doesn't do anything for you if you don't partake. The bread of life, if I'm invested in him and I eat the things that he teaches and I draw them into my life and I continue to grow in him and I continue to learn of him, my life gets changed. But my friend, If you don't do that, you can know he's the bread of life. You can know he's the living water. You can know he's the son of God. You can know that he's the high priest. You can know everything about him. But if you don't feed from him, then your life doesn't get changed. And the next thing you say is, well, I went to church and it didn't make any difference. No, it doesn't. Churches... Church without Jesus is just group therapy. We come in here and confess our weakness and try to get strength to go on just like a support group. We come in here to try to find the strength to overcome our weakness and to be able to go forward. But if you don't feed on Jesus, you don't get changed. (laughs) I've always heard this said, you are what you eat. Well, I am a corny dog. And I am a Vienna sausage with cheese and crackers. The truth of the matter is, I will tell you this, whatever you feed your soul with, you will become like. Hello? Whatever you feed your soul with, you will become like. That can be a form of music, that can be a form of sports, that can be a form of entertainment, that can be someone but whatever you feed your soul with, you will become like. Listen to what Jesus said. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart, come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which devour the man, but to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile the man. The Pharisees were saying, oh, you've sinned. You have eaten before you washed your hands. You did not cleanse properly and you're gonna stand under judgment. He said, you know what? Don't pay attention to how I'm eating figure out what it is that I'm I'm taking into my heart that is causing me to be like I am. You'll never change yourself. Hello? You will never change 
yourself. You certainly don't have control over any other person and you have very little control over yourself. There's only one who can take control of your life and change you and that's Jesus Christ. And he does that as you partake of him. You know, you take a hypodermic needle and you fill it with something and you shoot it into your body and you go, "Uh uh-oh, it's too late. You can't pull it back out. It's in there. Anything that's put into the system stays there. What you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, what you, what you pick up, all of those things stay with you. Every, every sound, every motion, everything that happens around you, all of that has to be processed and will stay in your mind in the pictures and the framework of your brain. Could I ask you a question? Is there a place for Jesus in there? Is there a place where he is what you're reading and studying? Tragically, I know too many men and women who have come to church for decades and they've never gone to a Bible study class. They've never taken the time to sit down, read the word of God on a regular basis. They're Christians. They'll tell you, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the things of the word. But do you know him? Do you know him? You, you, can, you can know all the rules and you're living by the laws and you can start telling people that they're right or wrong based upon the word of God. But that question is, are you being fed by Jesus? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not knowing about him, not having sung songs about him, but getting into a place where you really, literally receive him. Jesus said it very clearly, he who has the son has life. He who has not have the son does not have life. Receiving something, if you receive it, if you partake of it, it means to accept what was delivered to you. And Jesus delivered himself on the cross. But my friend, if you don't take that, there is no salvation. If you don't receive his blood and his body as the sacrifice for your sins and recognize the fact that without that cross and without that blood and without that sacrifice, we would be doomed to an eternal judgment by a holy God, not because he hates us, but because his nature will not tolerate sin. All the judgment of God comes down on any individual who has not brought the son into their lives. He says, I, that's where eternal life comes from. I, eternal life comes from Jesus Christ. Eternal life does not come by obeying the law. Eternal life does not come because you're better than somebody else. It doesn't come because you know the word of God. It comes because of him. When eternal life is imparted, when you eat this bread. That's what he said. When you eat this bread, that's when you receive. Now, does that mean that this is holy bread, that, that you know, this is uh, transubstantiation and you, you, take the, you take the cup and it turns into Jesus' blood and you take, no. He's talking about himself. But what does eternal life accomplish? He says, you will live forever. You will live forever. <laughs> Can I tell you something? 
After a while, life gets very repetitive. It's just another meal. It's another day. It's another day at work. It's another day that, you know, it's, it's another party. It's another place to go. It's another this, it's another that. Life gets, gets a little, you know, it gets kind of, and the, and the older you get, the, the more it kind of gets to the place where you're going, there's, I'm ready for something else. <laughs> I'm ready for something else. That last step, that, that last step, when God says, okay, I've worn out this body, let me give you a new one, come with me. Woo! I can't believe I got that high. <laughs> Man, live forever? If I thought I had to live forever in this body, I wish I'd known I was gonna live this long. I'd have treated it better when I was about 25 or 30. But I will tell you something. To live with Jesus and know his love and be surrounded by his grace and to hear the great things of heaven. To know that there is no time, there are no dates, there are no schedules to keep. To know that we can be with him. How do you get that? I, I, Jesus Christ, if you eat this bread. Well, let's look at this, recentering on the life of Christ. So then he says to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have, whoa, 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 no life in you. Not just you won't have a great life, Except you partake of me, receive me, draw from me, feed from me, drink from me, there is no life in you. There is no spirit in you. You're actually a believer in Jesus Christ. You're saved by the grace of God, but you're walking and living in death. And too many believers are walking and living in death because they are not continually feeding off of the life of Jesus Christ. Everything is ready, his spirit is within you. Without Christ at the center of our lives, everything is revolving around an unstable mass. Everything is bouncing around, it's like an unbalanced tire. Our emotions throw us one way and the other and our circumstances toss us around and there is no difference in the life of a Christian who is without Christ in their, in their living as someone who does not know Christ at all. I'm, I'm not insane enough to believe, well, I'm not, I started to say I'm not insane, but I'd get an object right there, objections to believe that the problems of the world are not present in this congregation. Amen? Amen. I hope they are. I'd, I'd love, I mean, I, I, boy, I'm telling you, I, I wish I had a church, I have a church full of people that are, you know, well, here's the deal. Sin, when it accomplishes its course, will bring you to Jesus. It'll break you down, find it in the place you gotta find something, amen? I mean, you're, the drugs will take you down, the spending will take you down, your attitude will take her down, your anger will take you down. You let sin run on out there and all of a sudden somebody's saying, I, I need something different, I need, I need Jesus. You know, when the, the minute you get married, it changes your center. It used to be I and now it's we. Can I tell you something? Ain't much sweeter than just walking with Jesus every day. Hello? Are y'all just sleepy? I mean, this, am I boring you here? And yet, so often, we know him, but he's like over here. I'm a Christian. I'm not walking in the spirit. Well, guess what? When you don't walk in the spirit, you, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? And so the truth is, it's not enough just to take the Lord's Supper. 
You see, life dissolves without Christ. He says, unless you eat, unless you eat, you'll not know what it is to have me in the center of your life. And then he says, I will raise you up. I will raise him up in the last day. Life evolves, life revolves with, with Christ. That's why it says when we're baptized, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Anybody want a little of that? Anybody ready to get rid of the dead man and come on up and get alive again? How about discovering what this is all about? How about understanding it's not all about, you know, I've got to pray and I've got to do what's right and I've got, oh, and I'm not doing what, and my attitude's bad. How about just walking in the spirit and knowing what Jesus wanted you to have and that is an abundant life. Joy and peace and love. Well, how do I get that? You feed on him. You feast on him, renewing daily in the life of Christ. So he finishes this and he says, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. <laughs> Boy, that's a swell of fellowship. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Uh, there's too many walking dead, folks. There's too many walking dead. There's too many believers who are not experiencing the kind of life that Jesus Christ wants to give because they're just kind of separating and compartmentalizing. And they don't know what he wanted to give you, joy. Now I'm gonna tell you, there's one thing I'm gonna do in life, it is have fun. I wanna live in joy. I don't wanna live in the, under the burden and the crush of all the stuff that's happening around me and all the things that are going on in the globe. I wanna be able to know something I can do that brings me immediate joy. I'll give you one, inhale Jesus. Receive his spirit. Let him overcome all the oppression. Let him overcome all the doubt. Let him overcome all the anger. Let him overcome all the grief. Having received and recentered, we draw from his life. Here's what we have to understand about the Christian life. Being a Christian is a process and not an act. It is walking hand in hand, heart in heart with Christ. You know, when Jesus responds to your wife out of you, it's a little different than what you might say. When you get disagreement with your parents and you're kind of all pushed out of shape because you think they're just insane and they're, they're just, they're not aware and you want to fight back. Jesus may have a different way of handling that than you might have. I feel for my little teenage daughter, Emery. She's 14. She'll be 15 in August. Oh my gosh. She's a teenager. <laughs> Oh, you don't know. Teenager is the different word for trapped. Trapped between adulthood and a childhood. Trapped in all the mo emotions and the, and the things going on inside them and trapped one moment you're an adult, one moment you're, you know, but I'm gonna tell you something. Jesus is Jesus. I don't care what your body is. You see, making a decision, being baptized, receiving the Lord's Supper does not automatically give you an abundant life. Do all of them. 
Give your heart to Christ. Receive Christ. I made a commitment. I made a commitment to follow Jesus. But my life didn't change. You didn't receive him. You made a commitment to follow him. You didn't make a commitment to be saved. Being baptized, making that public profession, that doesn't make you have an abundant life. None of those things will do that. Where do I find the sustenance in him? It's food and drink indeed. He who feeds on me will live because of me. Drink my blood indeed. Eats my flesh indeed. That's the sustaining person of Christ in us. And finally, the abiding presence of Christ. He abides in me and I abide in him. Right in you is Jesus Christ. Right in you. Right in you. He's not up there. He's not out there. He's not in here. He's right here. And so why don't you give him a little something to eat? The last point there is living because of Christ. We will live because of me. See, some of you are going through life, but you're not living You're going through life, but you're just burdened, you're broken, you're worried because you're not living that. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Uh Uh-oh. For without me, you can do nothing. So how do I know that I'm feeding off of Jesus? Remember what he said? It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. Bears much fruit. What kind of fruit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, not fruits, fruit. It's all one. All those things begin to flow out of you. I want you to know the fullness of Christ. I want to know the fullness of Christ. I want to know that it's not about all the actions and the programs and the stuff that I have to do and you have to do to to keep everybody going and keep the church running and try to provide an opportunity here and an opportunity there. I love the fellowship of this church, but I don't want you coming because of the fellowship of this church. I want you coming because you want to find Jesus here and you want to grow in him and you want to become what he promised you could be. Before we take the supper, I want you to bow your heads and I'm gonna read a prayer over you from Paul in Ephesians. And I'm reading this to you. I want you to know, to every one of you, I want you to hear these words. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. I pray today that as we take the cup and the bread, 
that you might understand this is an act that should represent us partaking of him. Jesus called his disciples together. The Bible says that when he brought them together, he, he said, I, I want you to do something. Our deacon chair and vice chair are coming. They're gonna lead us in prayer as we participate in this. Give you a moment just to peel back the cover on the bread and to take it out. Just as if you would come by and you would take and say, I want him in me. I want him in me. He, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Our vice chairman of Doug Dowd leads us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning, Lord, as we partake of this bread, Lord, we know it represents your broken body on a cross. Lord, but we also know that we don't worship a Savior that stayed in a grave, Lord, but that we worship a risen Savior. Amen. And Lord, I just pray that as we live our lives, we don't do so as a, just a box to check or a list of to-dos, Lord, but that we live in relationship with Jesus. I pray these things in his name. Amen. Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Now carefully remove the lid off of the wine. I want you to look deeply into it. There is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. That's God's design. It's got to be life for life. And what you hold in your hands as a believer is the testimony of Christ's blood for you. That peace that you hold is his blood for you. The chairman of deacons, Don, will lead us in prayer. Don Ever. Father, we come before you and we just praise you and we bless your name. Father, as we take this cup, just keep us mindful that that you shed your bloods for atonement for our sins for eternal life we just thank you for that and ask that you help us to leave a lead a life that is worthy of that and that you abide in us and that we abide in thee it's in jesus name amen drink from it all of you for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins He said, for often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you display something and that is that the Lord is coming back again. And my friends and I look around at this world right now, I don't think there's any doubt he's getting closer and closer. It can't keep going like this, amen. I want you to do something with me though this week. And this was a burden on my heart all night long Evil, evil, my friends, is real. Satan is real. Evil is having a heyday in this world right now. Evil is having a heyday in America right now. And I want you to pray with me that by the power of Jesus Christ, we will overcome evil. Amen. Well, the Bible says they sung a hymn and went out. We're gonna stand, do one other thing, get your wallets, give it the door. See you a little bit later. Sing. What he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. And all of God's people said, amen. You are dismissed.